I am Gil Santos. I'm your MC this afternoon, and my job is so simple, short, and sweet. I will go on with the house rules before we turn it over for the national anthem, and then immediately after the speaker, I'm going to turn over the podium to our moderator, Dr. Torina Aurelius Juan, who is going to take over from there and close down the uh, event. I want to thank the Osepi Laurel Memorial Foundation and the Lyceum Education Consortium for going in a co-sponsorship of Mr. James O'Bell's talk here in the Philippines. We are very grateful for that. And um, I think in a few minutes you'll be, you wonder, you'll understand why. I think uh, Mr. Zobel is an incredible storyteller, and I think historians need to be good storytellers. The Ortigas Library has 20,000 volumes. We, Mr. Rafa Ortigas, the founder, felt that it was important for Filipinos to really know their history, and in fact, even to rewrite it if necessary. And again, that is why we each chose Mr. Sobel to speak on a, on a subject that is important, that is the, the role of Filipino leaders in World War II, and in particular, President Jose P. Lauren. History for colonized countries always needs reviewing, given the portrayal of its people by the colonizers. The first written de description of Pacific peoples by the coming Spaniards were, we were labeled ladrones or thieves. It was alleged that the natives stole, but no record of the natives' version exists. Therefore, the Spanish account becomes historical truth found in libraries throughout the world. Overlooked are their own Spanish accounts about their callous disregard for the natives, their drunken behavior, their arbitrary detention of people, and of course the demands for submission, as in the case of Lapu-Lapu, resulting in the killing of Magellan and, in the, and the fleet and his fleet chased out of Cebu. The antiseptic Spanish version of that arrival, locked in our school book memories, was the beautiful solemn mass on the shores of Limasawa and the baptizing of the local king and queen. Magellan's death was a total misunderstanding. In the numerous uprisings, revolts, and eventual revolution against the Spanish colonial government, those who demanded equity, justice, and fundamental changes in the country were given various names, including insurgentes, traidores, tulisanes, and demonios. When the Americans proceeded to go to war against the Filipinos, historical accounts for the longest time made no mention of it. They called it the Spanish-American War, and if there was a brief chapter on Philippine participation, it would be called an insurrection with insurgents, fanatics, curamentados, and outlaws. Colonial powers have a penchant to pride themselves in making sure the population they administer are friendly, loyal, and accepting. So here comes 1941 and the Japanese conquerors taking over their American colony, the Philippines. Each power has a reason for existence and domination. Japan wanted to free the peoples of Asia from Western colonial domination, assuring a prosperity sphere for those under them. The United States, on the other hand, will not accept the takeover of their presence in the Philippines and their influence in Asia. They are not only the bearers of prosperity, but also the democratic light and the harbinger of freedom. They will fight to recover the lost colony. In the interim, 10 million Filipinos caught in the crossfire needed to be administered for its continued well-being as resources are dramatically reduced. The departing president, Quezon, instructs trusted men like Jose Pilarrel to take the reins of government and help its people. A new republic is formed branded by historians and propagandists as a puppet republic. The term is exacerbated given that a large group of Filipinos will fight as guerrillas throughout the occupation and will see the puppet government as aiding and abetting the conquerors. The victorious Japanese conquerors have the upper hand in the islands and for propaganda purposes describe people as they wish. 
those in the new puppet, puppet republic are fervent, quote, friends of the Japanese people. They spare no effort to use them as propaganda pawns to enlist other Filipinos to join them. The efforts, though, are a failure given the maltreatment and brutality of the Japanese towards the rest of the people. And yet, someone had to run the government. When the tide turns, the Americans return. The name calling goes into high gear. Those who participated with the Japanese were now called collaborators and sent to temporary detention in Japan. Ironically, those who fought the Japanese, some aligned with the American forces at war's end, were promised compensation and honors, but up to today received little to none of both. Many Class A and B Japanese war criminals escaped prosecution. Many who were as barbaric as Yamashita or Toho. Emperor Hirohito, who is responsible for the deaths of over a million Filipinos, is not prosecuted and allowed to retain his title. The hundreds of thousands of sexually abused women of Asia in the hands of the Japanese soldiers still have not received the compensation deserved. The lesson here is that the victor may write the history and name and brand people at will, but their domination is capricious, not just, without reason, and inconsistent. It is now 70 years since liberation, 69 of which has been as a fledgling republic. We can no longer finger blame the long gone colonizers. We need to review the appellations and the name callings that are stuck in our history books. We can begin with hearing historians like James Sobel, with his access to the MacArthur Library, to its files where documents, letters, books reside, much unread or digested, to figure out what really went into the colonizers' heads before, during, and after the occupation of the Philippines. President Jose P. Laurel, the third president of the Philippines and the president of the Second Republic needs a reappraisal. Let's hear it from what has been gathered at the MacArthur Library. May I call on James Abel. All right. Thanks, y'all. Uh, thanks to the Lyceum University. Thanks to the Jose P. Laurel Memorial Foundation. Thanks to the Ortigas Library. Thanks to the Bayleaf Hotel uh, for having me here. I really appreciate it. Uh, and it's really been a great trip. Uh, it's my third one here in the Philippines. And I really think that this has been kind of crazy because I've had to do, I think, six different talks. I'm not sure what day it is. I know it's the 16th, but exactly what day it is, I'm not sure. Most of what I've seen has been the inside of a hotel room and looking at the computer. Now, just to forestall any questions about anything, no, I am not related to Don Jaime Zobel. If I was, I would probably be down on Boracay and not here right now. It's funny because uh, the name Zobel has always been known in my family from the Philippines because my great uncle came here during World War II. Now he's just a lowly private and he lands at Nielsen Field in 1945. And there's a guy there with a sign that says Zobel. And he's never seen Zobel anywhere, so he goes up to him, well, I'm Zobel. And so they throw him in the car and they take him to the Zobel de Ayala mansion and all of a sudden he's like, I think you've got the wrong Zobel. So it's always been known, very much so in our family, how it relates to everything. Uh, past 20 years, I've worked at the tomb of General MacArthur. It's housed in the old 1850 City Hall building of Norfolk. And in 1960, uh, because Norfolk is the home of Douglas MacArthur's mother, Mary Pinkney Hardy, they offered it to him. Now, MacArthur had been offered to have all of his stuff at West Point, the Smithsonian University or institution, but MacArthur, I think, knew with Norfolk it was going to be the closest thing to a presidential library he was ever going to get. <laughs> And so he agreed to the deal and said he would actually come there and dedicate it. Dedicate a memorial to myself. Kind of fits in with Douglas MacArthur. But he promised to be there alive or dead. Died right before, kept his promise. And so it is the tomb of General MacArthur as well as Jean MacArthur, his second wife. 
April 11th, 1964, MacArthur was buried in the MacArthur Memorial, 13 years to the day after he gets fired by President Truman. He had been dead for seven days. He died on April 5th, 1964, laid in state in Washington, New York, laid in state right in the memorial, and 87,000 people came through to see him. About two o'clock in the morning, the night before he's gonna be buried, all of a sudden his eyes opened up. And everyone's like, ah! Running out of the memorial because he needed to go in the ground. Jean, his wife, lived to be 101 lived in three centuries. We buried her on January 26, 2000, General MacArthur's birthday. Just kind of worked out that way. Jean had a special deal to live at the Waldorf Astoria. It cost uh, about $3,000 a night. They had some goofy deal where they had to pay 300 bucks a month. They didn't expect Jean to live to be 101. <laughs> when we buried her, no one was there because she outlived everybody she ever knew. <laughs> Now, it is kind of a mecca, uh, the MacArthur Memorial, and one of the first people that came was President Diosdado Macabagal, and this is him coming there in 1964. It's a joint venture, it's owned by the city of Norfolk, it's a city museum, it does not get state funds, it does not get federal funds, it gets pretty much everything from the General Douglas MacArthur Foundation, which collects funds. This is our brand new visitor center, which we just built a couple of years ago. This is where I work, Gene MacArthur Research Center, it's the home to the MacArthur Archives, about 30,000 books, over 2 million documents, all the papers of Douglas MacArthur, 18 of his generals, thousands of collections that have been donated there because they know we're going to take care of it. Acid-free, temperature, humidity controlled, everything's going to be in perpetuity because that's what MacArthur signed the deal with Norfolk. You will have it free and open to the public. You'll never be able to charge a dime and the um, city of Norfolk can't stand us just because of that. We get about 5,000 researchers a year. I'm the only one there. Job security. <laughs> now this is one of our great and foremost visitors. You'll see Dr. Jose right there. That creature on the right, that's me. That's the way I usually look. Uh, my handlers have been kind of amazed that I show up in a suit because that's me. I'm not a historian. I'm an archivist. I collect things. I hunt people down to give me their stuff. That's why I first came to the Philippines in 2009 was to go to Pete Parsons' house and hold him captive until he gave us all of Chick Parsons' materials. So basically for the past 20 years I've sat in front of computer and catalog things. And that's why I say I'm not a historian. You will not hear any opinions from me today. You'll only hear what I've seen. And I brought everything with me. And I'm gonna donate that to the Lyceum University so anybody will be able to come there and see all of it. <laughs> MacArthur and Laurel, perspective of the warriors. People, that's what they've been asked to come here and talk about. There's a great deal, of wealth of information within the MacArthur Memorial that deals with this whole perspective. And as John Silva said, the collaboration issue. The problem is, is that everything owned by Douglas MacArthur prior to World War II all gets destroyed in the Manila Hotel in 1945. When he came here in 1935 as military advisor, he brought everything with him. He didn't expect to go back to the United States. He even brought his 84-year-old mother with him who died as soon as she got here. Manila was home. Mom dies here. His dad's best years as military governor are here. He meets his wife, Jean MacArthur, here. His one and only son, Arthur MacArthur, is born here. Manila is home. And he's not a colonial. I mean, everybody he mixes with are Filipinos. He met all these people early on. His first time in the Philippines was 1903, and that's where he first meets Quezon and Osmania was in 1903. You'll see this picture. This is MacArthur's third tour when he's head of the Philippine Department. And there you'll see Quezon, Osmania, Rojas, Carino, four presidents of the Philippines. This is who MacArthur mixes with. He and Gene, this is their set. This is who they go with. And that's what I mean. 
even though everything's been dis destroyed, we know that MacArthur knew Laurel beforehand. One of the only messages I have from the early period is when MacArthur gets recalled to the colors as you say the commander, July 41, and there's a letter that comes from Laurel saying congratulations to him. So we know that they mixed. We know that they mingled together. And then comes the issue of collaboration. Now, Douglas MacArthur has been called one of the most egotistical people that ever crossed the face of the planet. There was a guy named Enoch Crowder. He worked for Douglas MacArthur's father, Arthur, and he worked for Douglas MacArthur. And he said Arthur MacArthur was the most arrogant man he ever met until he met his son, Douglas <laughs> MacArthur. <laughs> but even the cynics knew MacArthur's mind. They knew this guy was brilliant. Eisenhower even said so. Eisenhower could not stand Douglas MacArthur. When they were here in the 30s, MacArthur eventually found out that Eisenhower was imitating him at parties. But MacArthur, or Eisenhower, said if you had a room full of the smartest people and Douglas MacArthur walked into the room, everybody knows he's the smartest guy in the room. That's what these guys think of him. Now, Douglas MacArthur graduates number one at West Point. Youngest Brigadier General in the American Army of World War I. Seven Silver Stars, two Purple Hearts, two Distinguished Service Crosses, two Croydon Gears. Youngest Major General, youngest Superintendent of West Point, youngest Chief of Staff ever, Architect of Victory. Well, you can understand why he had a big ego. But on this question, I think with collaboration, you'll see as we finish today that this is where MacArthur is at his best. And all he's doing throughout this issue is the will and the whim of Manuel Quezon to protect the Filipinos for the Philippines and to keep America out of their business. Now, MacArthur was called back to the colors in July of 41, becomes head of the Safety Command. Jose P. Laurel is asked to join Quezon's government, Secretary of Justice, in the fall of 1941. These two are on parallel lines. They will both be in the spotlight when war comes. December 7th, 1941, the Japanese sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. They had gone to Washington. They were going to deliver the war note right when the uh, attack happened, but they failed in that mission, and so it is a sneak attack. Eight hours later, you know what happened. Clark Field, 17 of the bombers wiped out. Air power's gone. Two days later, Cavite's wiped out. Now you've lost your air and naval power, and it's only the Filipino Army, Philippine scouts, and a handful of Americans that are here to defend the Philippines. 19 December, the Japanese land at Lingayen Gulf, making moves not only there, but further south of Manila, and will start the pressure cooker onto Manila. You say he's overwhelmed. They were unprepared. It was America's fault. It was a sacrifice command to them. MacArthur from 35 to 41 was telling, I need stuff, I need materials. You promised me everything, you promised me money, and none of it was forthcoming. So when they get caught in December of 1941, uh, it's pretty much a done issue already. Plus, MacArthur had changed the plans right before the war to defend on the beaches rather than to go to war, play in orange, retreat back to Batan, Corregidor, hold Manila Bay till the Navy comes. But the Navy wasn't coming. It had been destroyed at Pearl Harbor. Marikina, what was said? Now, MacArthur tells Kazon on December 12th, this is only a few days after the war has begun, that you've got to be ready at any time to go to Corregidor. Kazon doesn't want to go to Corregidor, but this is going to be an issue that not only the president, but Stimson, as well as uh, High Commissioner Sayre, are going to force or plead to Kazon to understand, just go there till the time comes, and then we'll redeem the Philippines, keep the Philippine government whole. Kazon knows he's going. All the cabinet wants to go with him. They don't want to stay here and face the Japanese, but there's only a handful that can be taken. Now, Rorel is told first off that he'll be one of the ones that goes. But then that position goes to Jose Abad Santos to go to Corregidor. And so at the Marikina meetings, Lorel's asking, what are we supposed to do when the Japanese come in? Now, Vargas said, Jose Vargas, 
Manuel Quezon's main administrator, said he had a meeting with MacArthur, and MacArthur said, you have to do what the Japanese say according to the Hague Convention, but don't sign the Oath of Allegiance. Now, this is going to be what they go by, what they say their whole modus operandi is throughout that early stage, as well as the whole occupation of the Philippines. MacArthur will say he never had that meeting. There's a guy named Steinberg, David Steinberg, wrote about the collaboration issue, wrote MacArthur in 1961, asked him, did you give them that instructions? MacArthur said, no, I never gave them that instructions. Now, MacArthur's known to lie. <laughs> but there's also a sense of, it's not a lie if you believe it. So we don't really know. I tend to believe Vargas and Laurel that yes, MacArthur gave him. It wasn't an official meeting, but probably just an offhand comment that comes from MacArthur. Eventually, they do have to go back to War Play in Orange. They're going to retreat to Batan Corregidor, hold Manila Bay, and then MacArthur tells Kazan that we are going to leave right now. We're going over to Corregidor. Like I said, most of the cabinet wants to go with them, but they're going to have to stay here. And Kazan's last words to Laurel is, I want you to stay here with Vargas. Help the people be the cushion against the Japanese oppression. And so these are the situation they're caught in. Manila's declared an open city to protect it, to keep it from being destroyed, like the Japanese should have done in 1945. Kazan's order, open city. Then the Japanese come in. That's what I say. Left to the Japanese to help the people. This is Vargas with Homa, Maeda, Japanese administration, Major General Hayashi, Jitaro Kihara used to be consul here. These are the guys who come to Vargas and tell him, you are going to have to set up this executive commission to be working at the whim of the Japanese. All the former cabinet get together, try to come up with a plan as to what they're going to do, and the Japanese pretty much say, there is no plan of what you're going to do. You're going to do what we tell you to do. And they want Vargas to be the head of this because he's an administrator. They don't want a politician to be head of this who has any support of the people. They just want an administrator. January 8th, they're ordered to form the executive commission. It comes through on the 23rd. And Vargas will be head of the commission. Jose P. Laurel will be Secretary of Justice. Aquino, Secretary of Interior. And these men will be working at the whim of the Japanese of what they want. Like I said, to help the people be that cushion. This is what they want to do. This is the desire that they have. And then Tojo starts dangling independence. January 22nd, 1942, goes before the Japanese diet and says, we're going to give the Filipinos their independence. Now, this is kind of a ploy to work with all the rest of the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere countries to let them see, oh, this is what we're doing for the Philippines. You work with us, and we're going to give you this as well. And the Japanese will propagandize this all over the Philippines, trying to get rid of any last vestige of American influence on the Philippines. It'll be totally popularized. And this is what Kazon and MacArthur have to deal with while sitting on Corregidor getting bombarded by the Japanese. It's complete control. Residence certificates, everybody has to have one. There's only six administrators to deal with over a million Filipinos in Manila to get these cards and you really can't go anywhere or be anywhere without them. The Japanese have cut off the city, the Japanese control everything, and the atrocities have already begun within the city and the main thing of slapping people around. What would it have been like if the Japanese hadn't slapped anyone? Maybe a bit different, but we'll never know because history is what history is how to counter the propaganda fury. You've got Aguinaldo, February 8th, broadcasting to all the troops on Bataan to surrender. You've got this leaflet that comes out from Vargas telling them all to surrender. The Japanese are just here to help us. Now, we know that Vargas is dominated by the Japanese, and so when this leaflet comes out, Kazon says, nah, this is just the Japanese forcing them to do what they do, but MacArthur is furious at this, and he'll carry this pretty much through the beginning of the war about what he feels about the people who were left behind to deal with the Japanese, but it will change. Kazan's furious as well. This is his letter to Roosevelt. All you care about is Europe? 
a distant cousin you're going to help while your daughter's getting raped in the back room? These are Kazan's words. Fury. Never forget. Never forget what they have because they were being lied to the whole time. All the message traffic within the MacArthur Memorial, MacArthur's always saying, is help coming or not? And they're all never say yes or no. They'll just say, help is on the way. Thousands of trips and troops are going to Australia. We're going to hold dominance over Mindanao, keep air supremacy. And they're lied to the whole time. February 1942, MacArthur is ordered out by Roosevelt to go to Australia to take a new command. Ro MacArthur doesn't want to go, but they go through all that message traffic and say, look, this is everything that's in Australia waiting for us. Let's get down there. We'll have a mounted offensive that comes right back. He gets down to Australia, finds there's nothing there, and will never trust Washington again. That's where the whole gap starts between MacArthur and Washington that will last all the way through the Korean War. Kazan is furious. He didn't want to leave the Philippines. He felt he should go back to Manila to take the brunt rather than having the people that he had left in charge. He wanted to be the one there. When he gets to Australia, he as well is livid and believes they have been completely lied to on Batan and Corregidor. Defeat comes April, May 1942. April 9th on Batan, May 6th on Corregidor. 75,000 go on the death march. 26,000 Filipinos will die in those camps at O'Donnell to help the people. Laurel's left here and they start petitioning the Japanese. You gotta let these people go that are in these camps. They're all dying. They're petitioning for Rojas. They know he's been captured down on Mindanao and only because of Japanese um, Nobuhiko Jimbo saving Rojas, seeing this man is a future of the Philippines. We cannot kill him because orders are coming through to that effect. That's probably what they're going to do because we know what happens to Jose Abad Santos. Taken on Cebu, killed down on Mindanao, and this strikes fear in all those people that are left in Manila. And that's the thing. People in America will be sitting there calling these people traitors from far away, saying, oh, we would have acted different. We would have acted like Santos. How come they didn't act like Santos? Nobody knows what you're going to do in that situation until that situation happens. You know, nobody knows what's going to happen when there's a gun to your daughter's head. Kazan understands that. MacArthur's going to come to understand that. But Laurel will be petitioning to get these people freed. He will be the savior of Rojas, no doubt. Especially when the Kempe died, comes on later in 44, wanting to arrest him. And Laurel's got the guts to stand up to him and say no. December 42, Galibapi, the last vestige of American control is ended. The Nacionalista Party is ended. This is modeled after a Japanese political party. Everybody has to become a part of this. You don't get government pay unless you're part of the Galipapi. Aquino and Ramos are made the officers, and because of that, now Laurel will become Secretary of Interior under the Executive Commission. Kazan, March 1943 knows what's going on in the Philippines, knows this independence is being dangled, and makes a radio broadcast over Voice of Freedom to the Philippines. Japanese promising you independence. Yeah, you'll be independent like Manchukuo. We know what happened in Nanking. We know what happened in Singapore. We know what happened on Bataan. Don't listen to them. All this is a puppet. Puppet government they're offering you. Look what the Americans did. This is Kazan saying this, not me. Gave us freedom of the press, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. Ended all those diseases that have been here. What are the Japanese offering you? Brothels. Don't listen to it. Stay, keep the faith. America's gonna come back. Words of Kazan. Now, as Secretary of Interior, while this is going on, Laurel is forced to go on this pacification campaign. Now, Laurel also is very fearful of all the degradation of the Philippines, the Japanese atrocities, and he comes to see that if they can end the guerrilla movement, or at least show the Japanese they're working to end the guerrilla movement, this will help the Philippines end the violence. 
because it's only the uprisings of the guerrillas that they see, at least, at least the Japanese, that is keeping the peace from being kept. So they go on a campaign to end this. Now, they offer a amnesty, the guerrillas. This is the guerrilla response. This is a propaganda note made on Negros saying, you know, amnesty or aid. You can see the gorilla there with the Japanese behind him with the bloody sword and Roosevelt bringing the aid. And that's what they're always, it's not America. When's the aid coming? The gorillas. And the gorillas will have a very different opinion of the people they say are collaborating. May 1943, Tojo comes to the Philippines. He's going to give them their independence. He wants to come gauge what's going on. So he comes here for Batan Corregidor Day. This is Laurel with Tojo meeting at the Manila Hotel. Regular anniversary of May 1943 celebration. Uh, the Filipinos are told to turn out with Japanese flags, and this is where Tojo gauges what the Philippines are about. It's a show. It's a show for the Japanese. And then it'll come to that they will grant them their independence. And the choice is Laurel to be president. Vargas is a he's an administrator. He doesn't have any support of the people. Ramos, Ricarte, Aguinaldo, they don't have support of the people. And plus, right before they make their choice, what happens to Laurel at Whack Whack Golf Course? They try to assassinate him. You know, Laurel will say that he knew what it was and never told anybody. Markings, Gorillas, Narciso Manzano in his memoirs will say, no, we wanted to show that we can get at anybody. Japanese will execute five, six people say are related to the crime, but the killer's never caught, I don't believe. Maybe someone else will say different. I hope so. I'm here to find out. But Laurel is the choice. He will be the president of the Philippines. Now, Laurel is a super patriot. You know, who cares about the United States? I'm here for the Philippines. I'm here for the Filipinos. This war is going to end someday. Let's try and construct a government, create a constitution that will lead us through afterward. Constitution there, make him head of the committee to create the Constitution. And Laurel will put in there a highly centralized government. You know, is this just for, to deal with the Japanese, to have a guy who's got a lot of power, or is this something that he wants to happen later on? There have been a lot of speculation by many different people, but Laurel never really says. So as independence is about to be granted, here comes Chick Parsons to report to MacArthur what's going on. He had gone into Mindanao in March of 1943 to set up a lot of Coast Watcher stations, figure out what's going on with the guerrilla movement because MacArthur had to know. He had sent in Jose Villamor, or Jesus Villamor, in December of 42, but everybody knew who Villamor was. He couldn't leave his little camp because everybody recognizes him. So he sends Parsons in because Parsons can move freely. I mean, most of the pictures you see of Chick Parsons in World War II are out getting a suntan. So he looks like a Filipino. Walks around in Filipino clothes, tries to get everything gathered together for MacArthur. When he comes back, he's been in touch with Tony Ozamas, who is down from Misamis Occidental, down in Mindanao. Ozamas has been to Manila. Parsons sends him again. Ozamas meets with Rojas to find out what's going on in the government. Who's loyal? Who isn't? Parsons sends a 30-page letter to Kazon about what's going on in the Philippines. MacArthur reads that letter. When it comes to the part about Laurel, Parsons says this is a master of doublespeak. He is totally loyal to the Philippines. He's just following your orders as what to do. That's MacArthur's orders, which you gave him and listen meetings at Cavite, meetings at the National Library, MacArthur crosses it all out. I never met Laurel. This is incorrect. I consider him pro-Japanese. Like I said, MacArthur's got his own ideas early in the middle, in the beginning of the war, but they will change. September 43, Laurel's hauled off to Japan to meet the emperor to be given medals, awards, and then to meet with Tojo, who says, okay, here comes independence, but now you have to declare war against the United States. And here's Laurel at his finest again. You can't do that. I don't have the support of the people. The manhood's wiped out from Batan Corregidor. 
We can't conscript anybody. I can't declare war now. Tojo's taken aback, but he deals with it. Okay. So, I mean, this is one of the gutsiest moves of Laurel throughout the war. October 1943, Dr. Amigdio Cruz is sent into the Philippines by Quezon. Like with Ozamas, he wants to know what's happening in the Philippines, so he sends his own agent. Cruz goes to Negros, meets with Villamore. Villamore says, there's no way you can get up the middle. I'm not even gonna help you. Cruz goes over to Panay, meets with Peralta. Says, Peralta says, there's no way you can get to Manila. I'm not even gonna help you. Cruz has been ordered to go through. So Cruz goes back to Negros and meets with Alcejo and Obsidi, two of the great guerrilla commanders. And they say, sure, we'll get you up there. This is a, if you know much about it, it is a comedy. Cruz coming to Manila because almost every place he shows up, minutes after he leaves, the Japanese Kenpei Tai show up and start arrest. It's almost like a Keystone Cops movie. Once he goes in one door, all the police come out the next door and they never can find him. But Cruz makes it to Manila, meets with Rojas, and it's a bit different what Rojas now tells Cruz as opposed to what he told Azamas because in this report he says that Laurel is a collaborator. And so now you've got two different reports coming back to MacArthur from the same guy, Rojas. What's that all about? Independence comes, October 43, Laurel is the president. You are a member of the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. You are the example to the other nations. Asia for the Asiatics, wrong. It's Asia for Japan, your puppets do everything we tell you to do, pretty much. But Laurel works for a vision of the future Philippines. Be that cushion to help the people try to go on. So, because this war will end someday. They ask all the nations of the world to recognize their independence. Roosevelt comes out immediately and says, no, we don't recognize you. You're a puppet government. I will deal with you when the war is over. This becomes US policy. This is Roosevelt's policy that the Americans will deal with the collaboration issue. But March 1944, Quezon sends messages to MacArthur. And they're compadres. And Quezon is the godfather of MacArthur's son. MacArthur knows what that means. And everything Quezon tells him he wants for the Philippines, MacArthur will do his best to fulfill that. Quezon says you cannot bypass the Philippines and go to Formosa. You have to go liberate the Philippines now or the Filipinos will never forget it. America has to come through on this. It cannot be let go. He also says, the collaboration issue has to be a Filipino problem. America can't be the one who's administering any kind of justice because the Filipinos will never forgive America for this. This is MacArthur's goal now. No matter what he thinks of the issue, this is what he will do. Fulfill the wishes of Manuel Quezon. Not the wishes of what American radical politicians want. Not his own wishes. He thinks there's only two people that can make MacArthur stand up and salute. One of them's FDR, the other one's Manuel Quezon. Now while Quezon is telling MacArthur this is what he has to do, you've got guerrillas saying death to the puppets and all that message traffic, a lot of which I'm donating, you'll find. Uh, Laurel, all of them, they're all collaborators, death to all of them. Now these are Americans, Sam Wilson, Clyde Childress, Wendell Furtick, Chick Parsons, but it's Filipinos as well. Salapita Pandatuan, down on Mindanao, Edwin Andrews, who will be on Negros. They're all saying the same thing. But MacArthur's going to make up his own mind, and it is the fulfillment of Quezon's wishes that he's going to perpetrate. July 44, the Pearl Harbor Conference. The Navy wants to go to Formosa. MacArthur, of course, I shall return. He's adamant to go back to the Philippines, believes that is the best access to defeat Japan. He's called on July of 44 to show up in Pearl Harbor. Doesn't know why, doesn't know Roosevelt's gonna be there. Shows up, there's Nimitz, there's Admiral Leahy, there's Franklin Delano Roosevelt to convince MacArthur of why they're going back to Formosa or to Formosa. And MacArthur gets up for a half hour with no notes and convinces them of why they have to go back to the Philippines. Remember what I said about Eisenhower, smartest guy in the room. 
Stupidest thing those guys did was get MacArthur into a closed room. He's going to talk him into anything. After the meeting's over, MacArthur looks to Roosevelt. I'd like to have a word with you. All the Roosevelt's aides are like, no, don't talk to him. Stay away from him. And MacArthur gets in there. You have the moral obligation to liberate the Philippines. You abandoned them in 42. The United States has forgiven you. They'll never forgive you for bypassing them. The Filipinos will never forgive the United States for abandoning them. No other country in World War II fought for a moral obligation. Europeans in the Pacific, no, they wanted their colonies back. Japanese and the Germans, no, conquest. The Russians, Russians sat outside of Warsaw and let the Nazis kill off all the Polish freedom fighters just so they could go in and set up communist dictatorship right after. That's so, so why I say, this is the best of America, this time frame, and especially because MacArthur. Because without MacArthur, they would have gone to Formosa probably, except that it can't be done once the meeting is over. Now, there's no decision made, but it comes to be that they don't have the shipping to get to Formosa, and also assets that were in China that would be used, like the 14th Air Force, are not there. The only route is through the Philippines. There is no other choice for American strategy because you can't go headlong in straight into Japan. Now, while all this is going on, all that Laurel is preaching is survival. Food is becoming a major problem. Starvation. The Japanese are seizing everything. Before the war, most of it came from imports from Thailand and other places. You had the drought in 1940. You had the floods in 1943. You had the Japanese changing nine districts over to cotton from rice. The Filipinos are starving, and everything about Laurel is in, in his March 1944 broadcast said, don't look to the sky for the Americans to come and give you food. All they're going to bring are bombs. Look to the plows. Look to the fields. We've got to be able to solve this problem. Gets rid of Narek, brings in Biba, the administration for food, and then puts Kim. Rojas in charge of that. Rojas had always been feigning sickness. This is the first time he'll work for the government. It is Laurel that pretty much keeps Rojas away from Fort Santiago in by time headquarters. Osmania's dilemma. MacArthur wants him to be there to go back to the Philippines. Secretary of State, or Interior Ickes, which controlled the Philippines in the pre-war period, wants a high commissioner to go with Osmania to tell him what to do. MacArthur says, no, you can't have that. It has to be a totally Filipino government. You can't have Americans coming in here, once again, fulfilling Quezon's wishes. The worst of America, Secretary Ickes. I don't trust Filipinos to be able to control themselves. High Commissioner's got to go in there with them. MacArthur will fight this guy tooth and nail, even later, even more so. Because of the bombings over Manila, Japanese forced the Philippines to declare war, and rather than saying we declare war on America, they say a state of war exists, but Laurel keeps no conscription. That's the main thing. They will not be conscripting Filipinos to go fight for Japan. MacArthur comes back with Osmania, October 20th, 1944. On December 29th, MacArthur issues his proclamation that deals with this collaboration question. Now, Roosevelt's policy, we're going to hold all the collaborators, we're going to try them all, but MacArthur's proclamation doesn't even call them collaborators, he calls them citizens who have given aid to the Japanese will be held by the United States for the duration of the war. They'll all be let go at the end of the war. That's what I mean, this is MacArthur mitigating U.S. policy, he said, we can't do this. It has to be a Filipino question. This proclamation is what firms it for everybody. MacArthur puts this guy on the left, Brigadier General Elliot Thorpe, in charge of CIC to start arresting the collaborators, remove them from circulation. That's what MacArthur says. This is the only thing I can do. I can remove them from circulation. And a lot of that is to keep them out of the hands of the guerrillas, who have nothing but vengeance in mind to start wiping them out. 6,000 be taken by counterintelligence corps and they'll they'll pretty much arrest anybody that has anything to do with anything under the knowledge that they'll all be let go later on December of 44 Laurel's government is removed to Baguio Yamashita says he's going to declare an open city 
Wrong. It doesn't. Lorel agrees to go to save the people and the city. December 21st, they take off. Gorilla reports report that he's left the city. And they go to Baguio until March when they go to the Cagayan capital and then they're flown out to Formosa. And they'll eventually get to Japan in June of 1945. Americans come back to Lingayan, the Battle of Manila. We just discussed it at length the other day, so we won't get back into it. But one of the interesting things is, is the 1st Cavalry Division, in their drive through the city, they set up a regimental headquarters in Laurel's house. And the guys are amazed. It's not lavish. There's not tons of wealth. It's a very Spartan existence, something they didn't expect to find they saw as the collaborating head of the government. A lot different than other people. Rojas is liberated, April 45. Now three times, Rojas told MacArthur he wanted to get removed from the Philippines by submarine. But MacArthur had always said, no, it's too dangerous. You stay where you are. You're doing a better job for me there in the Philippines. Once he's released, he's immediately cleared by MacArthur because of that fact. Nobody can understand this, especially Osmania. Rose, Rojas shows up with me, what is he doing here? Why him of anybody else? Now MacArthur will haul these guys into conferences, May 24th, May 25th, May 26th, 45, trying to get them to work together for the betterment of the Philippines, but these guys will never work together. They've got their own ideas of what they want. Osmania will say, he just wants to release all the collaborators. And Rojas will say, Osmania, I can't go along with any plans that he's got because he just wants to do what the Americans want. And this becomes the issue after the war. You know, what do we do? Collaboration issue becomes what is the main crux of the election. June 1945, MacArthur's on the way down to the Borneo. Invasions, the stops by Palawan. That's where they're keeping all the people that have been arrested for collaboration. This is Bonner Fellers. He's MacArthur's military secretary. In his diary, he writes that MacArthur goes in to visit them all. And he's just thrown. And even said, these guys are all my friends. This is everybody I've dealt with, mixed with in the pre-war Philippines. The only person he talks to is Matthew Gall. He says, I saw your son the other day. He sends his best love to you. And I think this is what really changes MacArthur's mind. You know, nobody knows what they're going to do until they're in that situation. All the Philippines was a concentration camp. Everybody had a gun to their head. And I think he came to understand that finally. Philippines are liberated. Yamash is held up in the Cagayan area, Cordillera. Atomic bombs, the end. War's over. Now, rather than stay in the Philippines, which I think the United States should have made happen, keep MacArthur there, be the guy who helps him out, they send him to Japan. Kind of crazy. Truman is the one who sends him there. They knew all the problems they had had with him, but MacArthur's engineers got in least fair Japanese he's there in the White House and convinces Truman that he will not have any problems with Douglas MacArthur. It's a decision Truman probably regretted many times over the next six years. But as soon as MacArthur gets ready to leave, 23 August 45, he turns over the whole collaboration issue to Osmania. Elliot Thorpe goes in to see Osmania. I'm giving you all back the collaborators. Osmania, you wouldn't really do that to me, would you? Oh yeah, here comes the truckload of all the cases, all the case files. It's in Philippine hands now. And especially, MacArthur goes to Japan, Supreme Commander of Allied Powers, He's now in charge of putting together Japan. He tells the Filipinos, I'll always be here for consultation, but this is my job now. He is a general. He follows orders. I know it's hard to believe that, but when Truman fired him, it wasn't for insubordination, failure to follow orders. It was just he wasn't in line with U.S. policy. MacArthur goes before Congress and you know, knows if they had tried to get him as a court-martial for insubordination, he would have fought it tooth and nail because he follows every order. He may fight it tooth and nail. He may tell you everything he believes and why he shouldn't do things, but once the order is given, he does go by it. 
Secretary Ickes, the worst of America. Here it comes, September 11th, 1945. Message to Osmania. How come you're not trying those collaborators? Ickes wanted to shoot them outright. No trial whatsoever. And says to Osmania, you don't start trying those people, we're not giving you any funds for rehabilitation. The worst of America. <coughs> September 14th, Laurel, Aquino, Osias, Vargas, they're all arrested in Japan. They go to Yokohama prison. They're not told why. What did we do? What's the charge? November, they're sent to Sagamo prison with all the other war criminals. Why? What did we do? What's the charge? Nothing's told to them. These are the orders of the Allied governments. This isn't MacArthur saying, I'm going to hold all these people. But he is given leeway of who's going to be tried and when. Now, MacArthur knows what's going on with Ickes. He knows that Paul McNutt, the high commissioner who's come back to the Philippines, is pressing to try the Filipinos in an American court because he doesn't think it's going to be done in the Philippines. Attorney General Tom Clark back in the United States sends a guy named Walter Hutchinson out here to the Philippines who recommends that a lot of these guys be tried by American courts. MacArthur knows this is what's going to happen, so he keeps them in Japan, and he doesn't send them back, and he doesn't talk to them because he knows if he goes to see them, it's going to be in the press, and everybody's going to say MacArthur's just going by his own whim and own will, but MacArthur's waiting. March 1946, War Department. What are you going to do with these people? McNutt, Attorney General, Tom Clark, Secretary Ickes. We want Laurel, Aquino, Vargas. We want to try them in an American court. What are you going to do with them? Why are you still holding them? And MacArthur comes right out. This is where MacArthur's at his best. This is a Filipino question. This is an American question. We decide what we're going to do with these Filipinos. Filipinos are going to hate us for the rest of time memorial. <laughs> this has to be up then. Independence is coming up in a couple of months. I'm going to turn them over to Rojas, and Rojas can do with them what he wants to. This is the Filipino question. MacArthur lays it right out, messages right in there, and be able to read it so eloquent as to why the United States has to back the Philippines, can't act like they are the dominator, can't act like they are the dictator to the Philippines. MacArthur comes down for independence, meets with Rojas and Malacanang, and they decide, okay, now Vargas, Laurel, they'll come back to the Philippines. Now the whole time, Vargas, Laurel, all of them are denouncing Douglas MacArthur. You know, he's the one keeping us here. He's the one not telling us what's going on, but he really is the guy who saves him from the radical politicians back in Washington. Rojas writes MacArthur right after independence, says send him back down. MacArthur does. Osmania has that people's court going. It's still going. They've been completely worried in Japan because they heard about Secretary of uh, Defense Teofilio Sison's trial and conviction. Laurel comes back, master of constitutional law. He'll be able to deal with anything that's thrown at him. And his big thing is, is when Truman decorates Wainwright back in the United States with a fourth star as well as the Medal of Honor, Truman says, you were the sacrifice for America's unpreparedness. And this becomes the crux of Laurel's case. None of that collaboration would have happened if America had been prepared and protected us. We were the American protectorate. Besides, all the Philippines was a concentration camp. Everybody will understand that. January of 48, the trial doesn't come to an end. Rojas grants amnesty to everyone. A lot of speculation as to what that means to the Philippines. But I'm an archivist. I'll just tell you what I've seen. 1954, Rojas goes to the States. He's been chosen by Mok Sai Sai to go create the new uh, trade deal. Calls up MacArthur, I want to come see you. MacArthur, yeah, I want to see you too. They get together, 1954, a private meeting. Associated Press writes MacArthur, 
Hey, what happened in that meeting? MacArthur, ignore it. This is between us, nobody else. But Laurel will come out and say that MacArthur had told him when he shows up in the Philippines, he had the orders to arrest everyone. But he said he never considered them traitors. You know, they did what they had to do. And Laurel, after we've got the messages, puts him right over there, sends him a box of cigars. Smoke them up on me, General! 1961, MacArthur comes back to the Philippines, a sentimental tour, given an honorary doctor of laws at Lyceum University. Makes this speech saying how great he thinks the university is building up the Filipino youth. Nothing but flattering praise. So Darren Laurel is the one who invited him, and they'll have correspondence that goes on after that. So that's it, that's my report. As promised, let me turn over the microphone and podium now to Dr. Farina Corilios Juan. She is going to do the moderation over there, from there, and my job is done. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, to our MC, Mr. Santos, and thank you to our guest uh, speaker, Mr. James Sobel. I'm Rino Aurelius of the History Department of De La Salle University, Manila, and my role for today is to uh, become the moderator for this uh, uh, open forum. Now, uh, we have three gentlemen here. Actually, four. I'm the only uh, female here. But uh, we have three distinguished gentlemen who would like to share their uh, insights and reactions to the topic uh, tackled by our guest uh, speaker. Now, uh, our first uh, reactor will uh, share with us uh, in order to complement the topic delivered by uh, James Subel, he will share with us important insights on uh, the relationship between uh, Laurel and MacArthur, I think, before and uh, during the war. So to add more to that, uh, I'm proud that he was my por former professor uh, at the University of the Philippines, uh, currently also the director of the Third World Studies uh, Center. Uh, foremost uh, historian of World War II in the Philippines, uh, author of uh, numerous books, journal articles on uh, the Japanese occupation of the Philippines, the Pacific War, diplomatic and uh, military, Jose, uh, mili military history. So uh, this is Dr. Rico Jose. First of all, thanks for having me here. Thank you and congratulations, Jim, for that excellent presentation. I'm not going to try to repeat uh, most of what uh, laid the overall framework, so I'm not going to repeat or I'm not going to go into too much of that. Uh, instead, when I looked at the program, uh, I got it the other day, I think, and saw that I was not a reactor, but I was a panelist. I, I began to wonder why I was se separated from the other two and that meant probably I thought I had to prepare something else. And so yesterday I got my notes together and did try to prepare something else. Uh, as I prepared it, I gave it a tentative title, Crossing Paths, because President Laurel and General MacArthur did cross paths personally on several occasions. Uh, here we have two giants in Philippine history in a very significant historical period. Laurel being a legal luminary, a political leader, MacArthur being a military legend, and the two of them crossed paths a number of times. As mentioned by Jim, the period before the war is rather sketchy. I've looked at the papers in the MacArthur Memorial, and indeed most of the important papers were lost, but uh, there were a number of interesting points where they, their paths must have crossed. Firstly, when the National Defense Plan was being drafted in its earlier days of execution, when MacArthur was here as military advisor to the Commonwealth, Laurel was then Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, and MacArthur was, of course, military advisor to the Philippine government. At this point, there were many legal issues that came up regarding the defense plan, uh, whether, in fact, one, the government could require Filipinos to report for service, whether the budget was enough, and so on and so forth. And, and, and Laurel, being Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, 
would have had to tackle some of these issues. So, doubt, uh, it is doubt. Uh, it is uh, it is beyond doubt that they would have met on several occasions. In fact, after the war, when they met in 1954, it was said that Laurel and MacArthur were good friends. There's a second point also before the war, when MacArthur would have become in, uh, intimately uh, intimately related with MacArthur, and this was when uh, Jose P. Laurel's son, second son, oh, rather, yeah, second son. Jose Sotero Laurel III went to Japan to study at the Imperial Military Academy. Upon his return, he became a regular officer of the Philippine Army, but not after a lot of arm twisting and talking to people in power. So once again, Laurel and MacArthur would have met on this occasion. When war was imminent in July 1941 and the USAFE was formed, Jim has said that Macar uh, Laurel sent a letter of congratulations to MacArthur. But also, Laurel writes in his war memoirs that Laurel offered his services to the Yusafe himself. Uh, the letter has probably been lost, but Laurel said that he offered his services as a, just, as a justice and felt that he would be useful in the Judge Advocate General's department, which he probably would have, in fact, been a very important figure. Unfortunately, Laurel was needed in the Supreme Court and later on became part of Quezon's war cabinet. Uh, as a member of Quezon's cabinet, Laurel attended the meetings in Marikina, sometimes with a raid war warnings in progress. MacArthur is known to come to Marikina once. The photograph that was taken of uh, Ma MacArthur in Marikina was taken on December 17, 1941. And I checked both Sutherland's office record and the MacArthur diary for that period, and indeed, it says MacArthur visits, but no other comments. Uh, in fact, the, the publicity statement said we are not giving any publicity to this. So MacArthur does go, attends that meeting on December 17. We don't, uh, Laurel is there. Uh, the photograph actually would show him on the extreme left. So they met there. Of course, we don't know what they uh, discussed at that point. After the 17th, there were many cabinet meetings before Quezon would leave for Corregidor. And as Jim mentioned, Quezon asked Ke uh, Laurel initially to accompany, uh, to accompany Quezon to Corregidor. But the next day, he changed his mind and told Quezon to stay put and instead deal with the Japanese when they came in. Uh, at this point, Laurel raised the question, if he was going to stay and Vargas and the others were going to stay, what were they going to do when the Japanese came? And Quezon told Vargas to ask Laurel, uh, ask MacArthur. At this point, the story becomes a little confused, depending on who you read. But the point is that it seems that what happened was Quezon asked Vargas to call MacArthur. And MacArthur was indeed called by Vargas. And the, what Vargas is told, many people have said essentially the same thing. The question posed to MacArthur was, what do we do when the Japanese come? And the standard answer, which Laurel, Recto, and a few others would remember, was the answer was, what can you do under the circumstances? You have to do what they ask you to do except one thing, taking the oath of allegiance to Japan. This appears in several war memoirs, not only Laurel's war memoirs, but also Quintin Paredes' report after the war and a number of other sources immediately after the war. Even Rojas's brief summary of his activities mentions this as well. And I'll go back to this. Remember, it is a telephone conversation, not a personal meeting. Vargas calls MacArthur, and MacArthur gives him this word. There are other, there's another version of this, which came out in the 1944 issue of Collier's magazine, which was a little more dramatic. This was written by an American journalist by the name of Royal R. Gunnison. And he says that uh, essentially you have some tough decisions to make, etc. And but but what uh, what MacArthur added it was if you take an oath of allegiance to Japan, we will shoot you when we come back. So it becomes a little more dramatic. But this is war news. It comes out in a war magazine, so there is probably some censorship there. Quezon also admits in his the good fight that he instructed Vargas and Laurel and the others to stay and soften the blow. 
although he does not he did not say that MacArthur had a role. This is a major uh, meeting or the major, major uh, instance where MacArthur and Lowell had this particular notice and they had this particular information. Uh, the second point that I would like to stress perhaps is again between MacArthur and, uh, and Laurel was the arrest of Laurel after the war. In 19, uh, September 15, 1945, Laurel, Vargas, etc. were arrested by the U.S. Army and brought to Yokohama's Kamioka prison, later brought to Sugamo after that. Uh, this was something that, in, in, interestingly enough, was uh, something that caused some of those arrested to be very angry. And when they found out this was MacArthur's doing, they were particularly mad at MacArthur. Uh, Vargas writes in his diary that he was cursing and cursing MacArthur. Uh, Benigno Aquino Sr. was also equally colorfully cursing MacArthur. Laurel did not curse MacArthur. It seems Mac Mac uh, Laurel knew something else, or he was more of a diplomat, or more of a gentleman. Uh, they stayed in Tokyo until July 23, 1946. And many of them asked, and some of their supporters after the war would ask, why did MacArthur keep them so late? Why did, he not, why, why did MacArthur not return them uh, right after the war? Or why did they not return them right after independence? This was July 23, 1946, so they stayed in uh, Sugamo prison for quite some time. Nobody understood the reasons until much later. Uh, Jim has mentioned some of that. Uh, he, Arthur felt he was protecting them from the United States, particularly Secretary Ikes, who wanted vengeance, very strict vengeance. And nobody, of course, would have understood that specifically in Sugamo because all of this was being done in, um, behind closed doors. Now another incident where MacArthur and Laurel crossed paths was in 1951. Not personally, but through an article written by an American jo journalist, Frederick Marquardt, who wrote an article, MacArthur on Laurel. This was published in the Philippines Free Press on July 28, 1951. It claimed that MacArthur saved Laurel from being hung by angry Filipinos by intervening and keeping him safe from these vengeful, vengeful Filipinos. Indeed, the mood in the Philippines right after the war was something where people were being killed, in fact, without trial. Uh, Marquardt quoted MacArthur as saying, if we hanged Laurel, we would have drawn a line of blood between the American and Filipino peoples that would never have been erased. Uh, the people who were kind of demanding that the collaborators be charged and hanged were people like Ikes and perhaps some of the more radical guerrilla leaders of the time. If you look at this particular period when the article comes out, July 1951, by this time MacArthur has been removed from power, he has already been sent back to the United States, and also by this time, 1951, it was obvious that Laurel was back in position, rising as a very prominent uh, Filipino politician. Recto immediately countered Marquardt's article. And since Recto was Laurel's defense counsel in the People's Court, stated that there was no foundation in law or history that MacArthur did save Mac uh, Laurel's life, saying essentially that Laurel owed MacArthur nothing. Recto pointed out to some details in the Marquardt article. Laurel could have been killed, uh, could not have been killed like the other uh, other collaborators in, in Europe, and there were technical mistakes in the article. He pointed out a number of items. Uh, Mark Ward said that Wang Qingwei, the Chinese puppet president, was killed by his own people after the war, which was not true. Wang Qingwei died in Japan while uh, undergoing a, a hospital operation. So Recto tries to bring out Another point, but again, this is not between Laurel and, and MacArthur personally. So one asks, did Marquardt report MacArthur correctly? Or was there something else behind this? Again, this is Cold War, the Cold War period. MacArthur has just been removed from Korea and brought to uh, the United States. And so there's probably a little more behind it that we don't know. 
interesting would be the meeting that Laurel and MacArthur had on October 10, 1954. That, that's the picture that we have here. Uh, Mac uh, Laurel was in the United States to negotiate the Laurel-Langley Agreement, but while in the United States, he made it a point to go to New York and to meet with MacArthur. It would be their first meeting since December 17, 1941. They had never seen each other since that meeting in Marikina. According to one report, MacArthur apologized to Laurel for imprisoning him in Tokyo. Uh, he explained the situation, Ikes, explained that MacArthur himself understood that Laurel was following Quezon's own instructions. Uh, it was a more diplomatic explanation, it would seem, long after the war, and probably not reflecting what MacArthur had actually felt during the war. But by this time, both Laurel and MacArthur were several years behind the war, and MacArthur would say that he had to be, he had to follow the pressure from Washington and London, as a matter of fact. Laurel, gentleman that he was, replied that he did not bear a grudge against MacArthur and did not say anything against MacArthur, unlike the others. Uh, MacArthur then talked about Laurel's mission in the United States, how important it was, and supported Laurel and advised him to see the top government officials in the, in the United States. They then said goodbye and never saw each other again. One interesting point after this is that although Laurel and MacArthur saw each other in 1954, seven years later, in 1961, MacArthur would write historian David Steinberg and say, quote, I gave no instructions to Santos, Rojas, Laurel, or any other Filipino leader on leaving the Philippines to assume command of the Southwest Pacific area with headquarters in Australia. There was no so-called Filipino delegation. Every Filipino except those in the armed services acted according to his own conscience as far as I know. This was a handwritten letter signed personally by MacArthur. If one looks at this a little more closely, it is correct because, one, there was indeed no Filipino delegation that saw MacArthur. It was a telephone call. And again, it's correct technically because MacArthur did not give any instructions when he left the Philippines for Australia because he had given the instructions in December 1941 when he left Manila for Corregidor. So if one picks the details, the letter is correct. And yet, there are second meanings behind it all. So one looks at these letters, and perhaps uh, on, on rereading re, re, uh, re the letter, perhaps one should consider also what Steinberg had asked Laurel, uh, what, what Steinberg had asked MacArthur in the first place, because one will respond to the way a letter is written, questions written. Now, MacArthur visited the Philippines in a sentimental vo voyage in July 1961. But by that time, Laurel and Recto and many of the other key leaders were gone. They had passed away, and Laurel and MacArthur's paths would never cross again. But, as we've seen, the Lyceum of the Philippines awarded MacArthur an honoris causa degree, which meant that, at least in spirit, Laurel and MacArthur were still crossing paths. MacArthur himself passed away in 1964, and with that marked the end of an era and the crossing of paths ends forever. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, enlightening uh, insight, Dr. Jose. Now our second uh, reactor is a world-renowned historian, economist, and book author. I'm sure that uh, many of us have uh, read his books. Former Deputy Governor for Economic Research of the Central Bank of the Philippines, Dr. Benito Legarda, Jr. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know about it being world-renowned, but at least I know some people read my books. Maybe not everyone. Um, I know almost nothing about the subject of MacArthur and uh, Laurel. Instead, I will address the question from the point of view of impressions of Laurel and the collaboration issue. Uh, let me t say in advance that I may not be the most objective person. My mother ran on the same ticket as Dr. Laurel 
in the 1949 elections. Uh, my uncle, General Basilio Valdez, Chief of Staff of the Philippine Army, was very pro Laurel. So uh, I, I will, in fact, bring up some things which I would ordinarily not bring up, just to counterbalance my own, my own uh, personal biases. Uh, during the occupation, uh, people were not quite sure what to think of Laurel. Uh, barber shop talk was Laurel, see si Laurel, pa killing, killing. He was uh, going from, swaying from, from side to side, which meant that he was not, uh, he was not really bending completely on one side or the other. Uh, and uh, in, uh, for, for people of my age, for people in our late teens, one big advantage, one, one big benefit that Laurel gave was he avoided conscription, which means to say he avoided getting us into Japanese uniforms and fighting on the side of the Japanese. That was a great thing, I think. The late Justice uh, uh, Isabagani A. Cruz, who was a companion of mine in our youth, uh, mentions this repeatedly. He was an admirer of Laurel. Uh, another, an, another incident that comes to me, this is a private uh, incident related to me by Thomas Ford, this American mestizo from Capiz, who was living in the Rojas household. He said that one day Laurel came to visit Rojas, and Rojas, and, uh, and uh, he asked Rojas, can we speak freely? And Rojas said, sure, sure. And Laurel then told him, I cannot stand the pressure anymore. It is too much. And Rojas told him, you have to stay because if you, if you leave, the Japanese will put somebody else who will be very bad for the country. It's possible that he was referring to Ricarte. Ricarte is a hero in his own right from 1899. But in 1942, history had bypassed him. And at that time, the Filipinos of the war generation regarded Ricarte with fear. They thought that if Ricarte was put in charge, uh, he would turn the country over completely to the Japanese. Uh, probably not, not just, but that was the impression. I'm, I'm relating impressions. Uh, and then when uh, Laurel refused to declare war at first on, 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 on America, but when the American raid started in September 21st, 1944, September 21st, 1944, he had to do something. So he declared with, I think with Rector's advice, he, de he formulated the, uh, the ex he declared the existence of a state of war, not declared war, which meant we are fighting you, but the existence of a state of war saying that there was fighting going on. And again, the people in Washington completely lost this. It's completely lost. The subtleties are completely lost on, on people in Washington. But it was picked up by every Filipino lawyer. They said, ah, existence of the state of war. And all the lawyers I knew were, were Notice that. Now, uh, what could be on the uh, on the debit side? Laurel saved a lot of people, Rojas among them, and one of them is Ambassador Perez Rubio, who's here, whose life he saved up in Baguio. But there was someone whose life he refused to save, and that was Lilian Rosses. Why I do not know. But the Rosses family to this day holds it against Laurel. That when they went to him to ask for his intervention, his reaction was, Rosses, is it here, guerrilla? So this is one, this is one uh, red mark, you might say. Does that seem characteristic of the man? But it's happened. I, I pass it on to you. Uh, uh, the other one is that a lot of people afterwards were saying, if Laurel was not a collaborator, why are the Laurels so intimately uh, associated with Japanese business interests after the war? Well, you know, after the war, 
people did what they wanted. And the, I think the governing consideration here is I think what has been mentioned, that uh, Laurel lived a very modest life. There was no, not, no ostentation, no luxury. It was really a very decent middle class existence so that if there were business connections, he certainly didn't make much money out of that. Uh, he maintained his decent middle class lifestyle all throughout. So again, let me reiterate, my mother ran with uh, President Laurel in the 49 elections. My, my uh, uncle, General Basilio Valdez, who was present in Marikina in that uh, December meeting, was also very pro Laurel. So there you have it. There, there you have what I have to say. Our last reactor is uh, currently uh, also a faculty member of the History Department of uh, De La Salle University, Manila. Very visible on national television. I think he took it upon himself to make history a very popular uh, discipline, okay? And for Filipinos to appreciate uh, history better. So uh, I'd like to turn you over to my colleague, Michael Charleston, but popularly known as Xiao Chua. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it was said that uh, you're not supposed to admit that you're nervous when you're uh, speaking in public. But now I have to admit, I'm very nervous because a lot of you here are notable people, people of note, and uh, I would really, really, uh, I, I'm really glad that I am here today to talk to you about this, uh, to react to Mr. Jim's uh, presentation. Now, um, I would be wearing two hats here, one as a professor, uh, no, assistant professor of history, and also as a media man. I took up my uh, history, but uh, BA and MA, uh, at the UP History Department, and one of my favorite professors to pick is Professor Ricardo Se. So, um, and there are so many things that I learned about, uh, the, the, the many, many things, the majority of the things, the clarifications that I learned about the war, I actually learned from him, and then I explored uh, further um, through reading. Now, uh, but I was already an enthusiast of history when I was young. In 1998, I was already, uh, I think, third year, second year or third year high school. Uh, in 1998, and there was this, and I, I began collecting uh, Ambeto Campos works. And that's when I first encountered President Lovell uh, in a more intimate manner. Okay? Because he, he told stories about the assassination of Lovell, and uh, I, I think he also said something about the love story during the time of uh, when he was student days. Uh, the slapping incident, I, I, I forgot about that. But basically, um, and then there were some recordings because they were, uh, what they call this, they were celebrating the centennial of Philippine independence. So there was uh, uh, an album called Sandaan, which featured voices of Filipino uh, personalities uh, throughout uh, the 20th uh, century. So, uh, Lowell was featured twice in the recording. Uh, one, he had uh, the declaration of uh, the, uh, the uh, existence of the state of war, that I, Jose P. Lowell, President of the Republic of the Philippines, do hereby proclaim that a state of war exists between the Republic of the Philippines and the United States of America and Great Britain. When I was listening to that, and no one was telling me what that means, I thought that this guy sold out. Huh? So it needed more clarification eventually when, when, when you go to history. But you know, the public had access to these kinds of recording in our image, has it? And uh, it's not really clear for many people. So people during the time of the, uh, after the war would probably say, uh, look, Laurel was good because he kept the, kept the, the, the country sane. But eventually the puppet president would stick to him but eventually, the generalization would go on and on. And that's, I think, a big uh, problem. Uh, now, I'm also coming from a, uh, a perspective that tries to be, in many ways, Filipino. And when it comes to General MacArthur, 
sometimes before before I, I came to Dr. Jose's uh, classes, I, I felt that MacArthur was actually a, a very lousy general. Why? Because William Manchester said that during the first uh, uh, hours after the Pearl Harbor uh, uh, um, um, bombing, 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 he was uh, in a way nowhere to be found. He was, we cannot uh, reach through him. Uh, and then of course there was the decision that they should go to the Philippines first because that was the promise of General MacArthur. And a lot of people are saying to me that if they went to Formosa uh, straight, we wouldn't have experienced a lot of the bombings that happened in, in different parts of the uh, Philippines and the destruction brought by both the Japanese and the Americans. So, uh, th this is where I was coming from. Until, of course, I began uh, reading uh, and attending Dr. Jose's lecture. And, of course, listening to your talk now clarifies a lot of things. Very quickly, I would like to uh, say something about that. Um, MacArthur being a lousy general, I guess we have clarified now that it, it, it would actually be more destructive for the Philippines if they did not go to Formosa. And eventually, if they, the Japanese still had forces in the Philippines, uh, maybe they could have chased the Americans even if they took Formosa. So it's good that he was able to pass by the Philippines. Now also, um, Okay. I'm now getting a, an impression that MacArthur, with the documents that you say exist, exists, he is actually a proponent of the self-determination of the Philippines, especially after the war. I think that's very surprising to me. Because, you know, there's always a MacArthur, a good taste he wants us to always be in America. You know, we're coming from the perspective that MacArthur was praised too much after the war and that the Filipino guerrillas did not have the credit during the, you know, during the, uh, in much of the, uh, what they call these discourses about the war, that the Filipino guerrillas were just at the sidelines. But now it seems that uh, uh, with the new documents, you, you, even yourself, you are director of the, Lowell, uh, of, of the MacArthur uh, Library and you yourself are very frank about uh, MacArthur's mistake, but also you also amplified a lot of MacArthur's uh, uh, good decisions. So I, I'm really, really thankful about that. Um, also, okay, mm. the only thing that I really want to ask you, but I will ask you privately, <laughs> is it true that MacArthur repeated the landings? I'm going to ask you that because I, I even have a picture here of supposedly it's MacArthur, I don't know if it's true or if it came from a film, that he was actually coming back from the beach, <laughs> going to the barge with the same set of people. So maybe I can clarify that with you because a lot of these things are, you know, in the minds of the people, MacArthur was so egotistic, people are dying everywhere and then he's going to repeat his landing. I don't want, actually, if, if, if we want to clarify it in, in, your, in your answer reply later, I, I, that would be appreciated. Now also, um, about uh, President uh, Laurel, when I attended, um, Professor Dr. Jose's uh, uh, classes, I eventually realized that Laurel is really maligned in many ways uh, because he's always, he, he, they always say that he was a traitor. And so, eventually, I came into a documentary about the palace, Malacanang Palace, in which Doy Laurel was telling, uh, was telling the story that, you know, whatever it was that they were eating, it was also the one that's being eaten by the whole populace. They did not have special food in the palace. They were eating the same thing that the ordinary man was eating in the street. But they did not enrich themselves during the war was in many ways a heroism. That he was actually meeting Filipino guerrillas. I, I, I was told in the class of Dr. Jose that he was actually meeting Filipino guerrillas in the palace where it was uh, I, I, I hope I remembered it right, where it was dangerous to meet. And eventually, that was uh, corroborated by the documentary that was released two weeks ago. Emmanuel de Ocampo, uh, one of the lead guerrilla leaders, was saying that he was talking to Laurel during the war. 
So these are really very good uh, clarifications that are now coming up. Um, I hope I did not miss anything. So yeah, maybe we are now looking at uh, yeah sometimes Filipino perspective. If you are too much uh, into Filipino perspective, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm still. Uh, a historian of the Filipino perspective. I'm a proponent of the Pantayong Pananaw. But, sometimes, simplistic, uh, uh, what do you call this? Simplistic uh, labels, such as puppet, you know, egotistic general. Uh, uh, we should, as historians, and as, you know, enthusiasts of history, we must look deeper into this uh, very, very uh, simplistic labels. That, uh, that we have placed on our uh, heroes and our personalities. You know, it's always like that. Del Pilar is the great propagandist. But we never know what Del Pilar did. I never, I never knew Del Pilar's works until I really read for my show, Showtime. So, you know, we always had labels, but we have to look deeper in that. And maybe with that, we can be able to look at ourselves uh, better. So, yeah. MacArthur had mistakes, but I guess I can say now that uh, he is more or less a friend of the Filipinos, really, a real friend of the Filipinos. And yeah, he may not be perfect, but he operated in the needs of his time and believe, he, and I believe that he had the best intentions. So thank you for clarifying uh, a lot of uh, this. So thank you very much. Dr. Ligardo, would like to uh, add something? Two very brief things for, for uh, just to uh, add to my biases. Uh, Doi Laurel is my compadre. Uh, now, the, the other thing, I, I, uh, on, on the basis of what Professor Chu has just said, uh, I was told that Mr. Francisco Ortigas, during the occupation, very late during the occupation, went to Laurel, asked for access to the Malacanang Library because the, the guerrillas need some document from there. And Laurel knowingly gave him that permission. I, this is a story that has come to me, maybe Mr. Montilla, who's here can, I, I can uh, uh, validate that. But this is what I have heard, and if that's true, uh, really Laurel was taking a lot of risks. Thank you for those wonderful insights. So we can conclude that uh, Philippine history must be rewritten. And I hope that this challenge is uh, uh, accepted by uh, his responsible uh, Filipino historians. Now, um, would you like to respond to that question or would you like to answer it in private? <laughs> uh, no. It doesn't redo it. There's 10,000 people on the beach. If MacArthur redoes it, redoes it, all of them are going to sit there and say, I saw that idiot go in and then go back out. He lands three different days. He lands at Palo on the 20th, he lands at Tacloban on the 21st, and he lands down at Dulag later on. Down at Dulag, he goes in by an LVT. He doesn't wait ashore. All the pictures, his pants are not wet. Now, there is on YouTube this film that they say is MacArthur going back off the beach to redo the shot again. That's Moratai. MacArthur at Moratai waded in up to his armpits because it was so deep for him to get in and then he goes back out later on. That shot on YouTube is him going in. Now, MacArthur knows the power of a picture. And he was ticked off about being put ashore in the water. But that night on the USS Nashville, here comes that picture. Yeah, look at that. Because he knows it's going to be on every newspaper the next day, which garners him 100,000 more troops, more support for his campaigns. Now, when they get to Lingayen Gulf, MacArthur's being driven into the beach by the coxswain of the boat. And the Seabees have built a sand berm so that MacArthur can land at the sand berm and not get his feet wet. The coxswain is driving for the sand berm. And MacArthur, hey, where are you going? 
It's like, oh, I'm going over to the berm over there they built for you. And MacArthur said, no, go to the beach. That's where all the photographers are. Because he knows that again will be on the front page and get him even that much more support for his campaigns. He's a master of public relations. He's a master of propaganda. He's not a goofball who's going to be redoing it because he knows they're all going to see it. But he is a guy who's going to take every opportunity to get what he would like. And so hopefully that'll silence it from now on. I received this request from the audience. If we can uh, kindly ask the good ambassador, uh, Miguel Perez Rubio, to relate to us how his life was saved by President Jose Pinorel. So, uh, the good ambassador, did we request him? It's uh, so um, It's great. You're not only an artist, but you are really a historian. <laughs> I 100% agree to just about everything you said. I have one question to ask you. What happened for Rojas that he kind of uh, changed his mind about uh, Norel, I think it was? First, the He's, he's in favor of Laurel, and then he kind of changes his mind, as told by the Dr. Cruz. So, uh, how come? It intrigues me. Well, that's what I said in the talk. I don't know. Because it's only a couple of months in between um, Tony Elzamas going to visit Rojas, and then uh, Emigdio Cruz going to visit Rojas. And so MacArthur all of a sudden has two different reports about what they think of Laurel. And like I say, I just tell you what I've seen, and I don't know why the difference uh, in just a short span of, of two months. Thank you. Thank you. Because. Thank you, sorry. Okay, my story. Well, <laughs> let me just say that. Um, I'm here today and I'm talking now to you because I owe it all to President Jose Pinarro. If it wasn't because of him, my head would have been chopped off. The first person that went and talked to the Japanese Kempitai, it was no longer Nagahama, there was a general then that had taken over by Nagahama. And the first one was Claro. I knew him very well. He became my guarantor. Uh, I, was, I was in prison with Johnny Smile at that time because he was the husband of Chona, later Chona Kasten. But he was the son-in-law of Recto. Recto first went to the Kempi Tai and said, how can you kill the uh, son of uh, the, my son-in-law who's married to my daughter. And how? We, why are we going to kill that 19-year-old that is, went into all these problems just as he was, would be playing with uh, lead soldiers? He's a kid. He doesn't know what war is or why he got into this mess. You should pardon him. And the Japanese told Recto, sorry, he's been condemned to death and we're going to carry the death sentence on both of them. So then, Reto went to President Laurel and told him what had happened. And I said, no, no, I let can't be. I'll go to talk to the general of the camp and bag him. And he went there and he said, how can you kill the son-in-law of my minister of foreign affairs? And that kid, who just a kid, he doesn't know how he got involved into this. He's probably read something about being a soldier, being in the guerrillas, and that's how he was waylaid into it. But he doesn't know really what's going on. So, and I will not stand for it. That's a question he said. I'm the president of the Republic of the Brazil, so I'm asking you to put them in liberty. Pardon them. The Japanese did answer him. They went, talked to him, and lo and behold, before you knew it, instead of my head being chopped, I said, you are free. Two days later, Johnny was free. Now, that was because of Laurel. Now, some time, a long time ago, many, many years after the war, somebody said, well, Laurel was a collaborator. 
And the people that were in the cabinet were also all collaborators. And I said, look, let me speak about Laurel. If they were collaborators, if this cabinet there was one that was a real collaborator, I will tell you, Laurel would not stand for it. And you said also, but Laurel's fear and the people that were in the cabinet, all of them, there's no exception, thought that Ricarte and the people that were related, the Macapilis, would have taken over, which is what the Japanese were insisting at that time already, you know? Karabati was already subject, and I'm going out of my subject, but it is very important to me to know. I was with them before I was put in the Kempita, and after I was in the Kempita, I lived in Cabinet Hill. And in Cabinet Hill, I met all the persons that were there, with the exception only of Rojas, who was not in Cabinet Hill. He was in South Drive, and the house of Rojas where was I? I was living there, okay? So I can also say that when they said that, I said, look, if somebody would not have stood for anybody that was for Japan, would have been me, because I had all my family wiped out in Manila, all killed. So I would be the first one that would be against anybody that was a collaborator, and I can assure you that no one there in that cabinet was a collaborator, much less the one that led that cabinet with strength and character and everything that one could wish on a president. And every time I go to Manakanyan, I always pass, of course, my quarry, because I really worked for her and I admire her, but also to Laurel. And I say to myself, thank you very much, Laurel. story. Now in the interest of time, because I have been always reminded that we should uh, finish by five, I think uh, we have uh, time uh, for two more questions from the audience. <laughs> Clarification or comment? So I think uh, we have the microphone in the aisle. So whoever wants to uh, ask Question, Mr. Larry Inades. Uh, James, uh, I always wanted to know if it's true that MacArthur uh, was given $500,000 by Kesson before he left for the United States, whether it was demanded of him or whether he volunteered to give it, I do not know. But the $500,000 was about equivalent to the entire budget of the Philippine Commonwealth government. It's, it's, there, it's really so much money, especially when he offered the same amount to Eisenhower, I think, for $46,000 instead of $500,000. That's what I'd like to know. Yeah, it's true. Uh, we have the executive order that uh, Quezon signs over to MacArthur. Now, MacArthur, in his contract with the Philippine government, as far as the Philippine military advisor, it was delineated in there that he would get a certain percentage of every peso that was put into the program. And because of the sugar excise which was dumped into it in about 4041, it works out to be about 500,000. But it stinks to high heaven because of it, under the circumstances of which it was given. And also because there was money that was given to Sidney Hobb to Richard K. Sutherland, to R.J. Marshall, these people who were not entitled to any money to be coming from the Philippine government. Now it is run by Roosevelt, Stimson, 
uh, within Washington that this money is going to be given to MacArthur and they agree to it just because of that stipulation in the contract. So you can say, yeah, this money comes because of that contract, but like I said, under the conditions, it stinks. Now, I admire MacArthur a great deal, but there's a lot you can't stomach about him. And people will always say, what do you think about Douglas MacArthur? And I'll say, what day, what year are you talking about? I don't believe he was sinister. I believe he had ambition and he wanted things. But the thing is, he asked for all those things and Kazon agreed to it. You know, when Kazon says, come to the Philippines, okay, I want to be a field marshal. I want a place to live like Malacanian. I want this much money. I want that much money. And Kazan agrees to it all. Now, when people offer me a job, I want as much out of it as I can get too. I think everybody does. And people can always say no. But those were the terms that were set. And like I said, when you come to MacArthur, you're sitting there reading one page saying, wow, that's awesome. And then you get to the next page and you're like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> and that's what makes him interesting. If you like him or you hate him, you look at his life and go, holy cow. I can't believe he did all that stuff. And that's the way it is. But like I said, I don't believe he was sinister. I believe he thought that everybody just wanted a roof over their head and food in their belly. And like the doctor of laws that they gave him at Santo Tomas, the head of Santo Tomas said, MacArthur is on par with Genghis Khan, Alexander the Great, and Napoleon, and he's better because he's not a general of conquest. He's a general of liberation and the defense of the rights of people. That's Douglas MacArthur. Thank you, Jim. One last question, please, from the audience. Yes, sir. You, you mentioned about uh, the state of war, where it was, in effect, a declaration of war. I, I am the oldest grandson of President Laurel and I had the opportunity to be with him in Malacanian because the, my grandmother, Lola Pacencia, refused to leave her house in Peña Francia because she says, this is my house. That's not my house. So I slept in the same bedroom as President Laurel. Sometimes, and just like Arthur, I would wake up, my bed was a little wet. But, <laughs> But I was, I was only 11 years old. Now, at this time, I realized later on that he was very religious. Why? Because at certain times of the evening, he would uh, wake me up if he comes late or after dinner, he brings me to the chapel in the basement and he would pray. And there are times when he would stay so long I fall asleep in the pews. But that declaration of war, he was in the chapel with me every night for seven days. And why? Because he was being forced to declare war by the Japanese. And finally, uh, on the seventh day in the morning, he calls the head of the presidential guards. Okay, I will now see the Japanese. The Japanese came and there was no TV, so it was a radio. And he made the declaration, but he inserted without conscription. But the Japanese didn't understand that word. So after he spoke, he ordered the uh, head of the presidential guards, close all the gates the next day, no? close all the gates, block the gates with all our vehicles. True enough, the generals came, and wanted to see the president, but uh, they would not be allowed. So they came back with a friend, 
you mentioned Consul Kihara. He was assigned in Davao and he became a friend of the president before the war. So let him in. And in other words, he was being forced with the generals to withdraw the statement of without conscription. So my grandfather told him in Tagalog, kami sa Batangas, pag nailura mo na, hindi na namin hihigupin yan. In English, if you spit out your saliva, we will not gather it back again. So he refused. That was uh, one incident. Now, somebody mentioned about the assassination attempt in Wakwa. Okay. He was hospitalized in PGH. And the Kempei Thais, the Japanese soldiers, would bring suspects for identification. And all of those guys who came in, my grandfather said no. But the last one who went, who was brought to him, he, he, he hesitated a long time. So my grandmother asked him, why did you, why did it take you too long to say that he's not the fellow? And the answer of the old man was, because he was the fellow. Oh, but why did you tell the, the Japanese soldiers? Because there are so many Filipinos who have already been killed during the war. He will just kill this fellow. Or they will just kill this fellow. So that's fine. Then he was arrested in, uh, in uh, no, Nara Hotel. In Nara Hotel, they had uh, uh, an American officer who was a graduate of Yale. And uh, I think the old man also graduated from Yale. And this, this fellow says, just, you know, to be nice to the former president. Oh, from one Yale man to another. But there was a good incident that happened. We are also after another Jose Laurel. That is, there are two. Because my father, uh, after lending me my grandfather decided to withdraw me to take care of my mother and my siblings and myself. So, so he he went with jo with Lolo to Japan. And there were three Jose's: Jose Laurel, the president, senior; Jose B. Laurel, my late father; Jose S. Laurel, uh, my uncle Pepe, who was also with them. So there is another Jose Laurel, and both Jose said, that's me. Now we, we are, we're only after one Jose. And the two brothers were trying to be the one, no? But he was an officer who he graduated from the Japanese military academy. Well, you're the one. That's, that's another incident. Okay, going back to the assassin. The assassin was called Little Joe. He was a six-footer. So finally, when my grandfather was brought to the Philippines to be incarcerated in, uh, so in, in uh, Bilibid prison, the fellow was there and knelt before President Laurel, crying and saying, thank you for saving my life. And then when President Laurel ran for president, he volunteered to be his bodyguard. This is something that I have not read from any book, and I thought I would share it with you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think if you go through the book of, uh, or the publications, the numerous publications of Dr. Jose, you will uh, read it. Um, Professor Williams, I'm very sorry, I just have to say this. I would like to make a public request to the Lowell family. If they can find a, an investor, because I've always imagined while listening to Dr. Jose's uh, stories during the time when I was a student, that there should be a Laurel movie. People should, be, should know what happened. In the media, we're doing our best. If, and this is just brief. I would like to ask you if you can look at some of the efforts that we have made. Uh, Tagumpay is one documentary. Tagumpay. Just search in Google, Pivao, Tagumpay, and we inserted something about President Laurel. 
There's also my segment, Shout Time, about President Lowell, that's XIAO, Time, Lowell, in Google. And also, uh, history with Lourdes de Vera. Uh, he was invited here, but uh, he sends his regrets that he cannot come. But we, uh, we, um, we, I'm the consultant of that uh, 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 series, and that we really fought because the some of the producers at the, at the networks they don't like the topic. But we really pushed that there must be a documentary on Laurel and in history with Lloyd, and we were able to uh, do that with the Dr. Rose and Dr. Aurelius as one of our as two of our uh, sources. So I hope that you can watch this and uh, and and propagate this. But uh, please, I hope that there's someone who's going to do something a film about Laurel. Thank you very much. I, I believe that uh, Shaw saved uh, cl video clips of those that he mentioned. Uh, unfortunately, it's already 5 p.m. I don't really want to preempt the the Laurel family, but uh, when I delivered this lecture at the Presidential Museum and Library in October, um, there was one question that uh, that was asked: uh, What do you think, or or is the best way to, uh, in the words of Mr. Silva, reappraise the role of J.P. Laurel uh, in the war? And I think I suggested that uh, we should think about organizing uh, this uh, conference or holding lectures such as this. I think it has been going on at the Lyceum of the Philippines. But I think 2016 will be a, a more meaningful date, considering that it's the 60th, Sheila, 60th, right? 125th. Birth anniversary of the anniversary of uh, President Laurel. So I hope that those uh, who shared their uh, stories to us would be able to uh, share also uh, their experiences in that particular conference. So uh, before I turn you over to uh, Mr. Pashon, uh, I think I, I better thank the organizers of uh, this uh, conference, the LPU, the Ocel Laurel Memorial Foundation, Ortigas Foundation Library, and of course the Laurel family, our speaker and uh, reactors, and I hope that uh, you will be able to uh, bring something uh, today as you uh, go home. Now, to deliver our closing remarks on behalf of the Presidential Communications Development and Strategic Planning Office, May I introduce Mr. For, Mr. Christopher Pashon. Uh, good afternoon. In behalf of Undersecretary Manuel L. Quezon III, I'll be reading his speech. It pains me deeply not to be able to join you today, particularly because of the personal invitation of Mrs. Laurel. Aside from the great ties of affection between our families, I myself am a great admirer of the great Senator Sotero H. Laurel, whose contributions as statesman and educator had added luster to the Laurel name, which is indivisible from the concepts of patriotism, statesmanship, and valor in the service of the country. I also very much like to meet James Sobel, who has been kind to my office in terms of our pursuit of history. The 70th anniversary of the Battle of Manila and the forthcoming anniversary of the end of the war have triggered an outpouring of memory and concerted effort to transition from remembrance to commemoration. As those who live through these harrowing days pass from the scene, it is incumbent upon the rest of us to continue the task of understanding and giving meaning to these life experiences. As part of that effort, I would simply like to share three extracts relevant to the topic at hand, which is the great dilemma confronting Filipinos at that time under circumstances unique to our country. We forget that alone of the nations in Southeast Asia, only we had a concrete expectation of independence at the time. Alone of all those nations, only we had an autonomous government and only we had our own armed forces pledged to the Allied cause. Let me begin with an extract from a letter of President Manuel L. Quezon to General Douglas MacArthur dated January 28, 1942. The relevant paragraphs are these, and I quote, 
in reference to the men who have accepted positions in the commission established by the Japanese. Every one of them wanted to come to Corregidor, but you, referring to Douglas MacArthur, told me that there was no place for them here. They are not Kislings. The Kislings are the men who betray their country to the enemy. These men did what they had been asked to do under the protection of their government. Today, they are virtually prisoners of that enemy. I am sure they are only doing what they think is their duty. They are not traitors. They are the victims of the adverse fortunes of war, and I am sure they had no choice. Besides, it is most probable that they accepted their positions in order to safeguard the welfare of the civilian population in the occupied areas. I think, under the circumstances, America should look upon their situation sympathetically and understandingly. Close quote. Here, just few paragraphs is the dilemma of those who had responsibilities of leadership at that time, in particular for those who could not be part of the government in exile. It goes to the heart of the debate over what the responsibility of the Filipino leader is to fellow Filipinos beyond any other ties, political, legal, or even personal, as they had to fulfill both public and their personal expectations of what constituted their duty to their country. This brings me to the dilemma faced by Sotero Laurel. When World War II broke out, Sotero Laurel was, the United States, was in the United States and came to serve Vice President Sergio Osmeña as his secretary. When the Japanese established the Puppet Republic and appointed his father, Jose P. Laurel, as president, Sotero did the honorable thing and offered to resign. In response to that offer, this is the response that Sotero Laurel received. Letter dated September 13, 1942. My dear Laurel, your letter of September 27 touched my very soul. Being a father and having a son, I understand what you mean. The question of your remaining in the service of the government of the Commonwealth, in the service of the government of the Commonwealth, must be decided solely about this question. Are you in conscience loyal to America and to the government of the Philippine Commonwealth, regardless of whether your father has in truth become pro-Japanese? If you are loyal to the government of the Commonwealth, it is your duty to remain in your job, and it is the right, it is my right to advise you to do so. I may say in passing that I am not convinced that your father is a traitor either to the United States or to the Philippines. I know him personally and have been closely connected with him officially for many years. I believe he is doing what he honestly believes is the best interest of the Filipino people for the time being, and not because he has become a tool of the Japanese. After saying what I have said, it is a matter for you to decide what you should do. If you are loyal to America and to my government, stay in your job. If you are not, resign, and I will accept your resignation forthwith. Sincerely yours, Manuel L. Quezon. School. I have always maintained that the sins of the, the sins of the father should not be visited upon the sins of the son, but the sons in turn had great latitude in uh, adding to or diminishing the reputation of their fathers. Therefore, the true measure of a father is what a son does to uphold and live by the code of conduct of his father. Nothing speaks more highly of Laurel than what his son did in his offer to resign and the reasons behind it. The letter speaks of itself apart from the judgment of his peers. I cannot, and I should not preempt what Mr. Sobel will be saying today. We can trust that it would be both interesting and thought-provoking. We must ponder what he said, both with the spirit of impartial inquiry, but also from a perspective of a Filipino. And here, the words of another great leader of that war came to come to mind in his eulogy on Neville Chamberlain, dated November 1940. Winston Churchill said, and I quote, It is not given to human beings, happy even for them, for otherwise life would be intolerable to foresee or to predict to any large extent the unfolding course of events. In one phase, men seem to have been right. In another, they seem to have been wrong. Then again, a few years later, when the perspective of the time has lengthened, all stands in a different setting. There is a new proportion. There is another scale of values. History with its flickering lamp stumbles along the trail of the past, trying to reconstruct its scenes to revive its echoes and kindle with pale gleams the passion of former days. What is the worth of all this? The only guide to a man is his conscience. 
The only shield to his memory is the rectitude and sincerity of his actions. It is very imprudent to walk through life without this shield. Because we are so often mocked by the failure of our hopes and the upsetting of our calculations. But with this shield, however the fates may play, we march always in the ranks of honor. Close quote. This is how statesmen must be judged. This is how generals must be judged. This is how the interplay of those who feel they have served their respective countries must also be judged. Thank you very much. Once again, uh, on behalf of the organizers of this lecture, thank you for coming and good afternoon.